Hello, my name is Mark Gibson, and you're listening to the podcast version of the Chagask Signpost series, a weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. Welcome to this morning's uh, Signpost webinar. Uh, I'm delighted to, to see that given our, our newfound freedoms, our numbers look to be still good and uh, that you haven't abandoned us. So you're all very welcome this morning. Uh, this morning's webinar is brought to you in association with Foodlink Ireland Skillnet, uh, National Rural Network and Dairy Sustainability Ireland. And I'm joined this morning to help with the questions by Catherine Keener uh, from Kildalton. Good morning, Catherine. Morning, Pat. How are you? And I'm delighted uh, to welcome back uh, Jane Stout from Trinity. Uh, she'll be talking to us this morning on valuing natural capital in the future farmland. Uh, it's great to have you back. Uh, Thank you. We had a huge response to the, the talk you gave before. So it's, it's a, I suppose, a continuation of the, of the theme. Yes, it is. Thanks very much for having me again. There's, I suppose, growing interest in the whole area of, of natural capital and how we consider the, and value what we have in, 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 in the countryside. Uh, and part of that valuation process is, is researching and, and beginning to understand and, uh, how we value that. You have, a, I suppose, a, a, a growing team in Trinity and beyond uh, supporting that work and, and, and furthering that work. That's right. So, you know, I'll talk about some of the work we're doing at the moment uh, this morning um, and where we're looking at um, developing natural capital accounts at, at various different scales. Uh, and what I'd like today is to really sort of um, myth bust a little bit and, and, and um, try, try and fill in some gaps. So hopefully it's, it's useful to the audience. OK, so morning, everyone. Thanks very much for, for the invitation to come back and speak again today. Um, I was asked to come and speak about the natural capital approach and how we can apply it on farmland and, and use it in farming systems. Uh, so we came up with this title about valuing natural capital for the future. Um, as many of you know, I'm an ecologist. I study interactions within nature, between nature and people. And I'm really concerned about the state of nature, both in Ireland uh, and, and globally, with widespread biodiversity loss, increasing climate change and pollution and a, and, a, and a generally deteriorating environment. And so my work tries to find ways to understand this loss of biodiversity, both from an ecological point of view. So how does this affect ecosystems and how they work, but also from a human point of view. So how does it affect our society, our economy, our health? Because nature really does underpin everything. It is our life support system. And this is what led me to the interest in the whole natural capital approach uh, and the formation of natural capital like Ireland to really promote this approach. But I, I do appreciate that it's approach not everyone is entirely comfortable with. So what I really want to talk about today is valuing farmland for the future. And most of Ireland is farmed. It's a really important aspect of our society, our economy, and, and of course our environment. And I'll explain about the natural capital concept a bit more as I go along and hopefully clarify, as I say, some, some myths around the idea. So if we're talking about valuing farmland, uh, what are we talking about? Uh, if we think about what's currently valued on farmland, and actually if you Google value of farmland, you get lots of articles on prices, land values on the market, buying and selling. Um, and just as an example, there's a, there was this piece in the, uh, nice piece in the Farmer's Journal a couple of weeks ago um, on, on getting your farm valued. And it's, it's nice advice on, on valuing your farm, including looking at the, the, the land itself, uh, the house, House, the access to roads, sheds, other infrastructure, livestock, machinery. But in terms of nature, having mature trees and shelter was highlighted as, as may or may not add value to your farm, depending on, on the type of farm enterprise. And conservation designation was, was um, highlighted as a negative. So designation of land for nature is seen as having a negative effect on value. Land is seen as, as being of, of marginal quality if it's designated for nature. And this is part of the problem. This land that's designated for nature may not be of high quality for production, for farming, but it does have a value. It does have a value to nature and a value to people. So we need to think about what value is. Um, and here are a couple of definitions. So the first one is the regard that something's held to observe, so to deserve, sorry, uh, the importance, worth or usefulness of something. Or secondly, the principles or standards of behavior, one judgment of what is important in life. And you can see neither of these definitions about value mention money. And farmland has so many more values if we think about it in a broader term rather than just thinking about money. 
And it's important to emphasize at this point that, that value can't be equated with price. We often think about value in terms of uh, what we might pay for something, but prices fluctuate, they're context specific, they're subjective, and, and they're relatively arbitrary. Whereas value is fundamental. Value implies the worth of a good or a service for an individual, whereas price is the amount of money that buyer is willing to pay in exchange for a product or service. So, for example, a bottle of water, if you live in Ireland, you can be constantly surrounded by water. We're not dying of thirst. We might pay two euro for a bottle of water. We still value it highly because it's necessary. Like all living creatures, we need water to survive. But if you're in the desert, and you're dehydrated, the value of that water is still the same. You still need it in order to survive, but you'd be prepared to pay an awful lot more. Um, so the value of something is, is what it's worth, not just in a monetary sense. And economists have uh, identified six sources of value uh, it, with regards to nature. And these, these are from the Das Gupta review uh, that was published last year. So first of all, uh, they point out that we wouldn't be here, humans wouldn't exist without nature. Um, and we know this because extreme forms of loss of nature, so for example, um, toxic pollution in water or loss of vegetation cover upstream causing landslides downstream, uh, degraded mangroves ceasing to protect villages against storms, all of these things, this, this loss of nature can cause loss of life. So the first value of nature is, of course, that we wouldn't be here without it. Secondly, ecosystems directly contribute to human health, to good physical and mental health. Uh, our lives are better when our, when our health is better. Uh, ecosystems filter pollutants, regulate disease, keep us healthy. And, and a lot of the natural products um, that form a sizable portion of, of pharmaceuticals um, come from nature. And we use these to maintain and regain our health. And thirdly, related to that is the indirect contribution that nature makes to human health. So it's a source of enjoyment. It has amenity value. Um, and so there's an indirect contribution to our health as well. Fourthly, nature provides goods and services on which we depend. And this is the aspect that's most commonly discussed in environmental economics, the so-called use value of nature, the few, food, the fuel, the fibers, the timber, the clean air, the water that we extract from nature and on which we depend. The fifth value is, is this existence value. So knowing that a species or a place exists, even if we never go there or see it, you know, we, there may be species or habitats, think about the orangutans in Indonesian forests that we will never see, but we still value them. And finally, their nature may be sacred to us or has its own moral worth. And this is really the, the intrinsic value of nature. So there are lots of values associated with nature and, and not just the value of the bits we buy and sell. But the challenge is how do we articulate these values in metrics that can be commonly understood? And how do we incorporate these values into our practices, into our decision making, into management and into our economies? So when you think about the, the value of farmland, it's not just how much we can get for it when we want to sell it. Um, but it creates healthy landscapes that we live in. Uh, the plants and animals that share those landscapes help to, to maintain them. Plants protecting the soil from erosion. Bees, other insects pollinating plants. Predators preventing buildup of pests. And of course, the non-farmed areas on farms like hedges, ditches, streams, peatlands, they help to regulate climates, to regulate water flow, to filter out pollutants and, and provide somewhere for wildlife to live. And there's also, of course, the cultural and traditional spiritual values uh, in the landscape, in, in, in fairy trees and features that have been there for, for hundreds of years. So our farmland and, and the nature that makes it up, the soil, the water, the air, the plants, the animals, is often much more valuable than is currently recognised. And the loss of nature is a risk. And as ecologists, we've known for a long time that the loss of nature is a, is a risk to, to humanity, uh, to society. But over the last few years, this has been increasingly recognised by economists. Um, and the World Economic Forum puts out a global risk report each year. And, and, and here's this year's version. Um, and this year, the top three risks in the long term and in terms of severity have been identified as climate action failure, extreme weather, which is linked to climate action failure, and loss of biodiversity. So these are risks that are particularly obvious in, in primary industries like farming, but they're actually seen now as risks for all businesses globally. 
So these natural processes uh, of, of, of um, climate change, um, of biodiversity loss are being recognized as being uh, important outside of the, the, um, the sphere in which they're usually discussed. And of course, loss of nature can compound risks. So for example, biodiversity loss makes the impacts of climate change harder to cope with. Uh, the removal of, of natural habitats upstream and intensified development of floodplains leaves some more susceptible to storms and to flooding, like in the, the photograph here. So there's a value of nature to people, to, to society generally, but also to business enterprises. And if we ask farmers, if we ask the farming community uh, about their goals and values, then researchers suggested that these are the kind of things that resonate. So pride of ownership, self-respect of doing a worthwhile job, enjoyment of tasks, making an income, meeting challenges, ensuring future income, expanding the business, continuing farm traditions, recognition, prestige. But none of these, um, sorry, some of these are, are obviously about uh, income, but it makes the point that not all values are about money. So when we think about the, the, the value of nature, the value of our farmland, we need to think more broadly. And as I said, the challenge is articulating that value. Uh, economists use different approaches uh, for different types of values. So for example, if we're trying to value the outputs from nature, uh, those that have a market, we can use the market price as a proxy for value. But remember, we've just said price isn't the same as value. Um, often the price we pay doesn't reflect the cost of production because some of the free services from nature aren't taken into account. So for example, the, the actions of soil organisms, of dung recyclers, of pollinators, um, but also the price doesn't take into account the long-term damage to nature from production. So in terms of loss of habitats, in terms of uh, pollution of the water, et cetera, or the cost of restoring nature, none of these are considered uh, in market prices. For outputs from nature that don't have a market, so there's, there's for example, there's no market for, for elderflowers or blackberries that are harvested from hedgerows or for, for views across beautiful landscapes. For these kind of things, we can use proxies. Um, so we can ask people what kind of landscape they prefer to look at, or we can determine preferences by counting how many people use those landscapes or, or go and collect blackberries from the hedgerows, how far they drive to do such a thing you know, how many park in a car park to go for a walk and admire the views. And, and this can give us some kind of measure uh, or proxy um, of these non-market values. Or we can use replacement values. So if a floodplain is damaged, how much does it cost to put in flood defences or, or to fix people's houses when they get flooded? But for most things, there is no market price and there's no sensible proxy. So this makes it difficult to articulate but it doesn't mean that there isn't any value. And here I come back to the natural capital concept. And the key thing about the natural capital concept and the natural capital approach is that it's not about putting a price on nature, it's about valuing nature. All of these various values that I've been talking about, the things that we use from nature, that we get from nature, and, and that the, the, the values of the inherent intrinsic values of nature. So valuing nature doesn't have to include monetary values. And the natural capital concept isn't a new concept, but it's really, it's a new language to link nature with the economy. It's, it's a bridging concept, if you like. And it borrows language from economics and business to illuminate the economic and societal impacts and dependencies that we have on nature. So the natural capital concept um, thinks about nature, all, all our natural resources, including biodiversity, so living organisms, but also non-living resources, rocks, soil, the rain, the sun, all of the environment. This can be considered as, as an asset or a stock. So this is our, our natural capital stock. And together, the soil, the nutrients, the sun, the rain, they all allow the production of biomass, so the growth of crops or grass to feed livestock, which results in marketable goods um, and economic activity. So the point of the, the natural capital concept is that we get flows of goods and services from these stocks of nature. And this, the natural capital concept really rests on this, this economic idea of stocks and flows. But it's not all about producing marketable goods, those other values, the landscapes, the pest and flood regulation, pollination. These can also be brought into, equation when, into the equation when we're talking about value. And the reason for using this language 
is to bring nature into the political and, and economic arena where it's been largely neglected so far, not valued properly and thus damaged. And the important thing about the natural capital concept is, is that without the stops, uh, without these natural capital assets, without nature underpinning the system, uh, then you don't eventually get your, your goods and your economic activity. Now, traditionally, when we, when we value nature and a lot of environmental economics, we just value the, the right hand end of this diagram. We, we value the, the, the outputs, we value the, the goods, uh, and, and we value them in economic terms. But we need to recognize that there is value in the assets, in the stocks, and to, we need to maintain and enhance those assets in order to ensure this flow of benefits. So it's not just all about um, valuing the, the things that we, can, that we can trade on the market. It's not just about valuing the services. We need also to appreciate these underlying stocks. So how can we do this? Well, one way is via natural capital accounting. So I've been talking about the natural capital approach, which is this whole idea about stocks and flows. Um, and we can then use natural capital accounting as a, systemic, a systematic way to to measure and report. So many people are familiar with, with national accounts uh, that give, give measures like uh, GDP and national expenditure, and they use this long established system of national accounts, which has been developed over many years as a standard. It allows com comparability across metrics, across countries, but of course GDP is, is bounded by the economy, not by the limits of the environment. It, it wasn't designed to, do, to, to look at uh, nature, it wasn't a measure of, of welfare. So it doesn't tell us the full story and it only looks at output. It doesn't um, look at the long-term income or the wealth or the stocks that are underpinning this output, including nature and natural capital and its degradation. So for example, in forestry, timber resources, are, uh, uh, the outputs uh, from forestry, timber resources are counted, but forest carbon sequestration isn't. And other services like water regulation by forests are hidden. So the system of national accounts doesn't tell us the full story, but it's what a lot of decision making rests on. So natural capital accounts then can encompass these underlying stocks, as well as these flows of services and benefits. And, and natural capital accounting, as I said, systematizes environmental information into, into an accounting format that tells a story of change over time. Uh, until recently, we haven't had a systematic way to, to measure and report on those assets and benefits from natural capital. Um, but the, the system of environmental economic accounting has been in development over the past 30 years. And in the last year, we we've seen now a, an international standard, um, a specific part of the SEA, uh, the system of environmental economic account accounting that deals with ecosystem accounting. And this is now a standard way to measure and account for natural capital in the same way that we do in our, our system of national accounts. And it's been developed so that the, the two can, can talk to each other. And it tells us not just about market outputs, but about these underlying stocks, their condition and non-market benefits and allows us to, to track them over time. And so this is the framework for the for the, the SEA, the the CEA, EA, the ecosystem accounting, um, which, which is, is, is pretty much natural capital accounting. Um, and the, the, as I said, you know, most of the valuation of nature is focused on the right hand side of this chain uh, or this framework, the benefits, the market prices as a proxy for services delivered by nature, the preferences of people, etc. But this accounting framework is really useful because it just it shows us that this is just one part um, of the framework. And the SEA ecosystem accounting approach allows us to create accounts not only of the flows of services and the benefits, but of these really important underlying stocks. And it's a spatial approach. So you create a map of your assets, their condition and the relative flows of services. And we're currently working uh, on several projects, as Pat mentioned at the beginning, several projects uh, trying to apply this system of accounting in the Irish context. So we're doing it at the catchment scale in the in-case project. So this is our EPA funded project um, where we are mapping um, asset extent and condition in various catchments in Ireland. So for example, in the Dargle catchment, which happens to be where I'm sitting right now, uh, we can layer up data sources on land use, on soils, on protected areas, et cetera, and create extent accounts. 
And this is um, Catherine Farrell who was leading this work and just published a paper recently last year, which describes this process of, 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 of gathering and layering these data sets to understand the extent of our assets. And there are challenges with data, uh, with data resolution and with data accessibility. But then the next step in the process is to look at the condition of those assets. Um, and if data in terms of asset extent is hard to get, data in terms of asset condition is even harder to get. But this, this map here that I've just popped up onto the screen shows um, asset condition based on risk status of waterways um, as assessed by the Water Frameworks Directive. So we can use, again, various proxies uh, for condition at this scale. And then the next step is to look at services. So what do each of these habitats or these assets deliver? Um, and we can come up with, this is where we work with the economists uh, and come up with these supply and use tables uh, for, for each of the assets, which, which um, sectors use them um, and which ecosystem services are delivered. And we haven't even got to the, the, the benefits um, where we can do the valuation. Um, uh, we can monetize some of these services where appropriate. So what does this mean at farm scale for the farmer? It's all very well doing this at catchment scale or, or at a biogeographical scale or national scale. Uh, what, what can we do at farm scale? Well, we can do the same sort of thing. So we can map um, the farmed and non-farmed assets on a farm. So as well as the, the, the pastures, we might um, map the, the grassy banks, the margins, the woody areas, and we can determine what services they are providing. As I said, some of these can be monetized, but others simply can't. But what this process can do is to, to reveal both the relative values of different aspects of the farm, as well as how they change over time as, as different management practices are incorporated. So it means that all the, the, the uh, quote, non-productive land, it, it's actually productive. It's not producing something that we've traditionally valued, but it's still productive. So this, I hate this term non-productive land. It's still productive. It's just producing something else. And eventually what this could do if we, we um, uh, follow this system, we could uh, end up with uh, proper payment for ecosystem services, for example, so farmers with large areas of land that don't produce much in terms of a marketable product can still be rewarded. But of course, that has to be balanced with the fact that we do also still need to produce food and there is still an importance of those provisioning services on farmland as well. Um, so we're working on doing this at farm scale with dairy farmers uh, in the Farm Zero C project. This project won the, the Zero Emissions Challenge Prize from SFI, working with, with Carberry as part of the Bioorbic Bioeconomy Centre, and really trying to tackle climate and biodiversity issues at a farm scale using a multidisciplinary and multi-institution approach. And, and Gavin and Kian spoke about this project in, in, an, in a signpost seminar early on this year, so I'm not going to talk too much about the project. What I am going to talk about is an important part of it that they didn't uh, cover in detail, which is the bit that we're leading in Trinity and it's the, the natural capital accounting. So what we're doing is we're trying to develop methods to map assets at farm level um, and Herdwatch, many of you may know of, of Herdwatch and they've developed the, this, this app to map areas of the farm for farm management. Um, and we've been working with farmers to, to map not only the productive areas, but also uh, these, these non-productive areas. I said, I hate the term, but I'm using it. Um, but this includes the, the woody edges, the grassy margins, the streams, the, the little patches of woodland, et cetera. And we're investigating whether, so we've developed a system to be able to do this uh, with the farmers, but also um, we're, we're looking at whether we can do, we can automate this, doing it with remote sense data to get accurate maps uh, quickly that can be updated. And Kian White, who's working with me and with Don Connolly at Trinity, is currently testing and validating this. So actually, does the remote sensing, is it better than, than, than the, a farmer doing it or, or a trained ecologist do it? You know, we're trying to test those different methods. And this gives us then the asset extent, the stocks of natural capital, both in the productive areas and the non-farmed areas. And then we can model the services that flow from all of these areas. But we also need to consider asset condition. Uh, so if it's in poor condition, it won't necessarily deliver all the services that it could. Um, and we know how important hedgerows are for biodiversity, but a poor quality hedgerow doesn't deliver as much benefit as a good quality one. And Farming for Nature has come up with some great infographics um, and, and these, these ones I've just pulled out here on hedgerows um, and great advice on how to transform hedges from poor to good condition. 
So if we can assess asset condition, again, either by direct assessment using uh, scorecards in the field or via remote sensing methods, again, we're going to work and try and validate both of these approaches. Then we can try and understand asset condition and also how it changes. So we can create these condition accounts, the second step in the, the SEA ecosystem accounting framework. And then lastly, the flow of benefits. Each of these habitats uh, can be assessed for the flow of services. Um, so we can see what kinds of services are being delivered by each of the habitats, and we can convert these into an accounting table. So this gives us then our flow of services. Some of these services can then be monetized, but others can't. So the next step would be working out which ones can and should be monetized, or how to bring these different measures, these, these um, services, measured on different scales, using different metrics, how we bring them together and how we use them to inform decision-making. And we're just starting this aspect of the work in the Farm Zero C project, working with Lars Hein at Bargaining University, who has worked on developing these kind of accounts at farm scale uh, in the Netherlands. So that would lead us to, to the, the third and fourth step in our SEA framework. And the important thing then is how do we use these accounts? How do we use our understanding of the stocks and flows um, of natural capital in our decision making? And this is what we'll be doing in a new project. So I just want to, to mention this, this project for ES. Uh, this time we're working uh, in forestry, um, but the tools will hopefully be transferable. So we're work working with Creel to Nature, um, funded by the Department of Agriculture to, to map the extent and condition of forest stocks, to determine service supply and, and benefits, and bring these things together in a management tool. And again, this project is, is literally just starting, um, and so hopefully at some point you might invite me back to, to come and talk about this one. So to summarise, there's more to, uh, to value than money. Uh, and we need to start to value farmland for its multiple benefits. Uh, the natural capital approach isn't all about money, it's an economic metaphor for nature, so it's about stocks of nature and flows of services and benefits, and about making non-market benefits visible, and about highlight highlighting that the condition of stocks is really important for that flow of services and benefits. Natural capital accounting is, is one way of quantifying and tracking changes, in stocks and flows, and natural capital accounts can be um, uh, generated at a range of scales. And the idea is that they help to, they don't make the decisions for you, but they help to inform management going forward. So I'll finish with that. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you very much, Jane. Challenging as always, and uh, challenging us to think differently, I think, uh, about the way we, we view the world. Um, there's, uh, I suppose, a, a, a number of questions coming in there uh, and uh, on a variety of, of, of topics. And I suppose one that's just come in there a few minutes ago in relation to, uh, I suppose, it may be a, a specific use of, of the, the, the process. And he, he asks, uh, how would natural capital approach uh, deal with the challenges around hedgerow quality and related problems with with the, the quality and ongoing uh, removal of them and how it, can it be integrated into how we, I suppose, try to manage and, and work with people? It's not yeah, an easy a, question now. It's a, no, it's a good question and, it's, and it is a real challenge is how do, we, how, how do we assess the condition of hedgerows? You know, what is a good hedgerow? What are the characteristics of a good hedgerow? Um, and, and, you know, what do we mean by good? Do we, you know, is the condition, are we talking about condition for biodiversity? Are we talking about condition for carbon um, storage? Are we talking about condition for, 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 for retaining uh, livestock within fields? You know, what aspect of, of that condition are we considering good or bad quality? So, you know, developing ways to assess condition is, is something that's really important. And hedgerows, obviously we know they're a really important part of the, the landscape for, for, for many reasons. Um, if we can, so the second part of that question, sorry, could you repeat the second part of that question, Pat? Yeah, no, it's, it's, I suppose, how do we, we use it, the, the natural capital approach to try and, and influence, I suppose, the management at, at, at ground level? Of, yeah, of, so, uh, so I think that, you know, the, the, the beauty of the natural capital approach then is, is to, to illuminate all of those different values of our hedgerows. So um, if we have a hedgerow that's, that's very uh, tightly 
cropped, it's, it's, it's you know, a, a short foxy hedgerow, it's, it doesn't provide as many services and benefits as, as one that's big and, and uh, mature and full. And, and I know Catherine's spoken on this before, you know, it doesn't provide as much habitat for wildlife. Um, it's not storing as much carbon. It it's, um, has a different impact on the, the, the local um, microclimates. And so by uh, using this natural capital approach of, of defining those, those assets, of, of looking at the condition of those assets, and then determining the services that are flowing from those assets, then we can start to make management decisions. So if the, if the, the, the point of the hedgerows is just simply uh, to provide a delineation between two fields, then that it, it has a different role and it can be managed in a different way to, to, to a hedgerow that you, you, know, you want to encourage for biodiversity. So it's really about making decisions with full information. And I think until now we've been making decisions without full information. Yeah, and there's a, there's a, a, I suppose part comment and part uh, question here in relation to um, carbon accounting, we're beginning to make progress, but carbon accounting has the uh, advantage of there being a single, single common denominator back to carbon, whereas with uh, natural capital accounting, you, you're trying to value across a, a, a myriad. So I don't know whether that's a comment or a, a, a question, but it's, 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 it's definitely, it's a challenge. I mean, I think, you know, and, and carbon accounting is part of natural capital accounting. And I think that's, that's what natural capital accounting, uh, the approach tries to do is, is, is one say it's not all about money, but it's also not all about carbon. And we've become very fixated on carbon um, and carbon budgets. Um, and, and that's not the only thing we need to be concerned about. I suppose natural capital accounting helps us to, to, to show that as well. One here, I think I, I, I have to get to, to put to you. Uh, you had a picture of, of biodiversity growing behind a shed. How do I explain to my wife that I'm not lazy and the area doesn't need to be sprayed uh, as it's only growing weeds? And then please don't read out my name. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, I mean, I, I'm laughing, but that is a really serious point. And we've encountered that not just um, on farmland, but in the cities as well, is, is that, you know, you, you, you look like you're not bothering if, if you're leaving the weeds to grow. Um, it's, it's a change of perception. Don't think of them as weeds. Think of them as biodiversity. Think of them as, as food for, for pollinators, for bees and other insects, for, for uh, you know, produce seeds for the birds to feed on. So, you know, they're a really important habitat for biodiversity. Um, and I think, you know, that's that's a, that's a shift of perception um, and, and as I say in, in urban areas you know I've had people say that their, their neighbours would frown at them for not mowing the lawn and, and you know all these weeds coming up in the lawn and then you put a sign in the middle of it that says I'm managing this area for biodiversity and suddenly you go from being the lazy man who can't be bothered to get the mower out uh, to the, the, the nature loving hero so um, yeah it's, it's, it's a perception change but good luck. <laughs> Catherine, a lot of questions starting to come in there. Yeah, and I'll go back to the first one that came from somebody who has lived in Indonesia where a bottle of water costs more than petrol and um, does or maybe should the property value think of natural flood barriers of natural reserves or natural pest control measures? And, and I guess that, that's what we're saying is, is that um, the natural capital approach helps to highlight all those kind of hidden values uh, when we think back to the, the first conference that we ran on, on natural capital in Ireland, uh, we called it High Ireland's uh, Hidden Wealth, because it's just that all of these things aren't visible at the moment. Um, can a natural capital credit be created in the same way a carbon credit is created, created through the voluntary carbon markets? Oh, gosh, I don't know that I know the answer to that question. Um, I'm not yeah. sure. I'd have to think about that one. Good exactly. question. Thank you. And is, is there a maybe a, a lead a following one? Is there a methodology available to show natural capital similar to Vera? But again, maybe that's a very specific one. Is it? Sorry, Catherine. What was that one? So, is there a methodology available to show natural capital similar to Vera V E R R A? Have you heard of that? Uh, I I haven't heard no. of that. Um, I mean, I suppose you know when we talk about the the you know natural capital and what it is. It's, it's a very multifaceted thing. So there's, there's no one metric um, to, yeah. to describe it. Yeah, I think that's very specific on the carbon side. Um, just a couple of specifics on your own uh, work. Can you, uh, is Forest ES focused on large scale, such as Quilcher, or will it address um, ecosystem services at far farm forest scale? So the scale of, of the forestry in Forest ES. 
that's 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 another good question and we're just starting that project um i i I, I'm hoping that we would be able to encompass a range of scales of, of forest, uh, forest enterprises. Um, I don't know exactly yet whether we'll be working specifically at that kind of the farm scale of forests, um, but I, I think we will try and encompass a range of scales. But um, yes, thank you. For yeah, that maybe, maybe something to think about, yeah. Um, yeah. Is the project you're doing at farm level with dairy farmers are all farm types? At the moment, it's with dairy farms. So we, we started with um, uh, dairy farms uh, and the, 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 the idea is that it would be transferable. So the, the methods and the tools that we develop should be transferable to other farming systems as well. But um, we thought we'd, we'd start on a smaller scale. OK, thanks. Maria. And Pat, I'll just finish for this round on the tough question there. I'll take it um, uh, tough for, for Jane. So nothing new in this presentation, only a different language, which is creating unnecessary jobs for more people and taking money out of farming and agriculture. And um, presentation would be better suited to urban dwellers who are somewhat removed from nature and have the perfect manicured garden instead of natural wild gardens. Yeah, no, fair enough. I mean, I think the it, everybody needs to change their approach, not just urban dwellers. Um, I think, you know, it is a new language for things we already know. You're absolutely right. It's, it's um, you know, farmers have known the worth of their land for a long time. It's, it, it's, it's a new language uh, to try and translate that worth into, as I say, decision making, into policy, uh, into uh, economics, because that's, that's, most decision making is made on on that basis um and so by using this language um it is helping to to illuminate the, the these values that absolutely people have known have been there for a long time and Pat, perhaps i'll take the, the biodiversity one here as well how can the occurrence of uh our rare species data um and hence rare habitats being incorporated incorporated into you know when you're valuing this these species have a far higher significance than the usual utilitarian purposes to which other species are applied you know so it, how do we deal with the rare species i suppose and really important as opposed to the common um yeah absolutely so so the the, the system allows to to um uh, to quantify biodiversity so you know it depends how you quantify biodiversity and what metrics you use so you could use just a sort of total number of species or you could use the presence or absence of particular species um you know so through the the process of creating the um the asset extent accounts you can incorporate um protected habitats for example so these designated areas that you know, may have been considered as, as of having little value in the past, um, you know, then their biodiversity value can be recognised. So biodiversity can be seen as a service that flows from these assets. So that, that's, that's, that's an important thing to notice that biodiversity is part of the asset, but can also be seen as part of the, the, the benefit that's coming from these areas. Back to you, Pat, for one. Okay, two. yeah, and there's a, I suppose, a, a question there from Dara Hulhan. Uh, how do we add market value uh, to farm systems that are high in natural capital? Or I suppose it, you could extend that to how do we monetize that so that uh, so that those farmers can continue to 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 manage in that way. Yeah, I mean, this. It, so this comes to the the the, the difficult end of the um, the the SIA ecosystem accounting, the, the the benefits and actually monetizing those benefits. And as I say, we can monetize some of those benefits. Some of them we can't. Um, so it's about using the appropriate um, uh, monetization, using the appropriate tools and the appropriate metrics. Um, but yeah, I think you know then then. Absolutely. That's that's why we're working with the with um, economists on these things, because, you know, I, I'm an ecologist. And I'm much more comfortable down the stocks end than down the flows end of, of the uh, the SEA process. Um, but yeah, Dara, that, that's absolutely something that should be possible. And, and, and that would be the next step. Okay, a, a, a question or comment here. Some counties are currently involved in updating county development plans, uh, rewilding some of the public spaces and roads. Uh, might be an idea uh, for for the environment and also plant some wildflowers and, and plants 
uh, which are attractive, especially in tourist areas. But I think there's possibly a, a leadership element of, of that work as well to uh, coming back to the point you're talking about of, of seeing that uh, not being totally neat and tidy is, is, is a, an acceptable and a, a, and a desirable way to, to, uh, uh, um, to, to, to work in. I think it's, maybe it's more of a, a, a comment uh, than, a, than a question. It is, but, it, but it, I think it makes a good point. You know, we talked about creating these natural capital accounts. So the, the CSO has a, the, you know, this is something that we, we are going to have to do at na national level. And CSO now has a, a unit uh, on ecosystem accounts and they've published their first ecosystem accounts um, at, the, at a national level. Um, we've been working through the in-case project on developing these accounts at a catchment scale because that, that, that makes sort of biogeographical sense to work at a catchment scale. And now, as I say, we're working at farm scale, at forestry scale. So, you know, they can be useful at a range of scales. Um, and, and, and as the, the, the person making the comment points out, you know, it can be useful for highlighting the, the value or the benefit um, of, of not managing uh, our edges and hedges quite so intensively as we have been doing. Uh, a question there, uh, in relation to uh, CAP and, and new agri-environmental schemes and a lot of work currently going on in terms of uh, uh, designing a new results-based approach, which would be, I suppose, two-fifths of the, the agri-environmental schemes. Would you have any advice for, for them or any uh, uh, ideas for them as to how they could incorporate some of your work into, into their design of their processes? Yeah, no, the, the, the results-based schemes, um, you know, there's some fantastic examples. Um, you know, one of the things, as I said, that we've really struggled with is, is asset condition. Um, and the results-based schemes can, you know, the, 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 the assessment of condition for, for natural capital accounting is similar as the assessment of condition for results-based payments. So you need to improve your condition in order to get your, your payments through the results-based schemes. Um, and natural capital accounting can help you then to track that improvement um, over time. So the, the two things do sit neatly beside one another. Um, and, and absolutely, those methods for, for condition assessment are, are really important. Uh, a question there is, 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 thanks again for a lovely presentation. Uh, is there a case to be made for a rating uh, system for lands based on, on uh, a wider national capital criteria, uh, similar to BER for buildings or, uh, I, I suppose, a, a natural capital value of different farmland uh, 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 areas? Yeah, it's, it's, I, I find it quite difficult to come to a kind of, you know, a final rating or a score because it depends what, what natural capital you value um, and which services you're looking at. So, you know, quite often you might have uh, trade-offs in, in, in your service flows. So it's, it's what you prioritize. So, so your, your rating at the end depends on, on what you value and what you prioritize in terms of um, the way that the land is managed. So I think it's, 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 it's kind of too complex to come with a, you know, one final score or, or, or index. And it's actually, it's that complexity which is important. I think simplifying it down too much actually takes away what's important, which is the, the, the detail, the complexity that's in the middle. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about that one. Okay, Catherine? Yeah, um, just a comment there. The carbon farming has been flagged as being future in streams for farming, but um, the, the person thinks you have highlighted that natural capital is a much more sustainable approach. So that's the support for what you're doing. Uh, do you have any examples of natural capital accounting approach in upland areas? And, and the further comment that you used a phrase non-farmed areas, but the, these areas, uh, I'm not sure I, what, what exactly you meant, but these, I think they're thinking of the areas that are farmed within a policy framework based on productivity. Um, so it's, you know, again, it's tied into farming the uplands. But have you any work on the uplands, uh, Jane? Yeah, so, so Catherine Farrell that I, that I mentioned earlier and, and who I think is there in the audience um, has just uh, published a couple of papers um, applying this natural capital uh, accounting process to peatlands. So peatlands um, in, in, uh, across Ireland, different types of peatlands, including in the uplands. And so it can be used as a way of uh, identifying and highlighting the, the, um, the condition uh, and the service flows from 
these areas. So um, I'd say you go and have a look at some of Catherine's papers. If she's there, she might pop it into the, 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 the comments. Very good. Uh, in your own opinion, do you think policymakers are ready to start using this or is it still at the very early stages? Um, I think we need to be ready. So, I mean, the 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 SIA, the, the ecosystem accounting standard was was accepted globally last year. It's in the um, in a in our SDG targets, in our um, biodiversity targets, in in the Green Deal targets to incorporate uh, the the value of biodiversity and ecosystems into our national accounts. So we we are obliged to do it, and we have started to do it. So that the, the CSO, as I, as I mentioned, has started um, to create ecosystem accounts. So, I'd, I'd, you know, whether whether we're ready for it or not, we kind of have to do it. I think is the answer but there. You, I suppose, in your opinion, do you think policymakers are? Um, we're getting there. <laughs> Good guess. Um, you mentioned. Did you mention the Herdwatch app? I don't think there's a habitat mapping function available on it currently for all farmers. Can no, you it's, it's, uh, and, and, and I, I'm not an expert, um, and so apologies if I get this wrong, but as far as I understand, it allows mapping of, of the fields and, and what's in each of the fields, but I don't think it does allow the full habitat mapping, no. Yeah. So that's what we're trying, we're trying to sort of, you know, yes, uh, build yeah. on that in yeah. this project. Yeah, very good. Over to you, Pat. Yeah, uh, I suppose you've tweaked somebody's interest. Uh, there's a question there, are there more jobs planned in, in, in these sectors so, and, and how can we, we access those jobs? Yes, <laughs> I, th I, I do think, you know, there, there are more jobs, uh, there will be more jobs and there are already more jobs for, um, for, for, for you know, we, we, we've got quite a lot of people who understand the economics, the services, the benefits, um, the assets and asset condition, you know, that kind of that, that, that ecological knowledge, that ecosystem knowledge, that, that's where we need people. You know, we can't, economists can't do this in isolation uh, from, from the people who understand uh, what's going on on the ground. So we've already seen an increase in demand for people with skills to be able to, to map and assess, to be able to do this kind of natural capital accounting. Um, I do think there are going to be a lot more jobs in this area in the future. And particularly, you know, I say jobs for ecologists. I actually mean jobs for people who can talk across disciplines. Um, and I think for a long time we've been very stuck in our silos um, and, and this, this, uh, this idea that we need to, to, to move out of our silos. We can't just do this. Ecologists can't do it on their own. Uh, we need people who understand um, uh, geosystems and atmospheric systems. And we need people who understand uh, satellite mapping and, and, and model creation. And we need people who understand economics and service flows and benefits. So it's a really cross-disciplinary space. Um, and so we need people who who are, are are have breadth as well as depth, I guess. So yes, it's a very long answer to a short question. Okay. And Pat, I have just a very specific one there. Are, maybe a question or suggestion about farm buildings? Are they included, particularly thinking of barn owls, swallows, and bats, etc.? Are they valued in a in your farmland assessments? Um, yeah, so, so I mean, this goes back to the previous, uh, an earlier question about specific species, rare species, you know, so, so biodiversity can be incorporated into, in, you know, specific aspects of biodiversity, specific species can be incorporated uh, as, as a service, you know, so if, if that's something that's valuable is providing habitat for, for those species, then yes, that, that can be included in, in the um, So the I think you, you, you'd agree then the more knowledge we have of these and the more both the farmers and and, and the people doing the assessments understand of absolutely of that. yeah and, yeah, and that's yeah. you know this comes back to this point about you know that if we, again using the terminology if we think about them as part of the stocks then then you know the you're understanding more about our stocks and the benefits they deliver so you know barn owls they they play an important uh, role in in uh, pest control so they're wonderful and fabulous species and part of our biodiversity, part of our, our, our natural capital, but they also do provide a service and play a role. So it's it's about it's it's about it's it's not just about looking at what they do for us, but about them intrinsically as their their biodiversity value as well. 
Yeah, so I suppose it's just a few warnings coming through there about like if, if rare species are rare for good reasons and if, if we who are doing this work don't recognize them, we'll have more of the common and less of the rare, uh, which, but you know, I, I, that's not what you're, you're obviously were. Yeah, no, yeah. absolutely. And, you know, and, and that's the thing, not everything needs to be abundant. Um, yeah. Yes, yeah. you know, but understanding ecosystems. It's all about yes. education and, and yeah, awareness, isn't it? That really is important. And understanding the ecology yeah. of systems. Yeah, understanding that, that, you know, we can't have all species equally abundant, that they play different ecological roles in the system. Uh, it's a couple of, uh, of questions, there. just, I suppose, a, a, a comment to say uh, uh, sustainable and self-sustaining are not uh, necessarily the same. Uh, and I think what's been alluded to there is that there is need for positive management in, in the delivery of uh, uh, biodiverse uh, uh, areas and landscapes. It's not, it's not just a case of leaving it to its own devices and letting it, uh, letting it go wild. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. And um, I think that's that's often a, a sort of a misconception about, um, about nature is you just put a fence around it and leave it to it. Um, in a lot of cases, you do, you know, you, you're right, absolutely. There needs to be sustainable management um, of that nature, um, for, you know, for, for whatever output you want. If, if your output is, 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 is more nature, wildlife, then maybe you do put a fence around it. But if your output is, is, is a, a, a landscape in which there is sustainable use of resources, then, then that's a different thing. And absolutely, it does really need management. There's a, a, a question about ecology students taking economics courses in, in, in uh, universities. To what extent do, do the universities incorporate the two, uh, uh, um, I suppose, uh, uh, areas in, in single streams of training for students? Probably not, is, is, is the answer. It's Traditionally not, no, absolutely. Traditionally, they, they would have been very, very separate. I think more and more now uh, we're seeing um, programs that are integrating. And I think from, from the point of view of addressing environmental challenges, that's really important. Um, and recently, you know, I was talking to some um, Leaving Cert students recently, and traditionally they'd have said to me, you know, if we're interested in these topics, what, um, what college course should we do? And I'd have said, oh, you know, you need to do natural sciences, environmental sciences, something like that. But I think increasingly now I'd say, do whatever you're interested in. But if you're interested in this environmental aspect, make sure that you, 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 you know, uh, get some of that into your, your, your college course, either by badgering your lecturers or taking different modules or, um, you know, or just making sure that those conversations I said don't happen in silos and that we're able to, to, to have these multidisciplinary conversations and work across those, those traditional uh, barriers of discipline. The question there in relation to the relative roles in, in progressing towards your utopian future, if you want to, to put, to, to, uh, uh, I, I know it'd be a bit facetious there, but, but the relative roles of, of legislation, market uh, creation, and I suppose knowledge transfer and, and, and personal development in, in a, I suppose, getting to where we want to get to in, in this respect. Uh, yeah, relatively all important. And I think, you know, we need this, if, if we are gonna change uh, our system and, and address biodiversity loss and, and properly tackle uh, climate change, we need change um, everywhere. So we need change from the top down in terms of legislation and policy. We need change from the bottom up in terms of, of behavior, in terms of consumers and what they do, in terms of individuals and what they choose. So I think it's, it, 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 and, and education and knowledge transfer throughout that whole chain so from bottom up from top down i think it, it, it's all it's all important absolutely yeah i suppose it's keep coming back to how how can farmers make a living from it you know very everybody very positive all very noble aspirations but we live in a world where everything is monetized but i know that's not for you jane but i mean that is the question isn't it how can how can farmers make a living uh, from when they are doing a good job Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and it, that's a really important question. Um, and I think that's, that's where we need to get to is to make yeah. sure that, that we are um, valuing livelihoods and, and well-being um, as well. Yeah. Um. Okay, I think we're, we're getting pretty close to the end of the, the, the questions. I don't see a, a, a huge amount more coming in. I mean, it's, it's, it is, a, a, I suppose, an emerging science our, our emerging discipline of, of trying to combine economics and it, it reminds me a little bit of, of I suppose some of the early work we did when I uh, 
a long time ago when I came into the organization of, of looking at how you evaluate progress from an economic perspective, where people were looking more at profit, where but we started to look at the, the development of the balance sheet. And it struck me uh, that is some of what you're doing is you're not just looking at what you're taking off and judging everything by what's taken off, being taken off. You're looking at the reserve and the bank of what's there in, in development and what we're, we're, we're developing in our landscape as a way of valuing uh, uh, the natural capital there rather than what we're able to take off it on an annual basis. Yeah, exactly. and, a, and a comment on that yeah. about, um, you know, looking at where you're actually, is there looking at valuing carbon reductions? That fits in with what you're saying, Pat. It's not all about what we take off, how we reduce um, harm or reduce carbon reductions. So listen, thank you very much. It's been, I, I think, a, a, an interesting and, and uh, a very challenging uh, 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 talk. And, and I think it's challenged a lot of our, our, our viewers. So once again, uh, uh, thank you very much for, for, for your presentation. Like next week, uh, we were joined by uh, Marion Sorley, uh, looking at uh, the carbon footprint of, of dairy farms uh, along uh, the Atlantic coast of Europe. So I suppose it's, it's looking at the, the, the context of, of uh, carbon footprinting on a temperate uh, grassland agriculture. Uh, Thank you very much to Yvonne for uh, uh, her support in, in, in running the, the, the webinar this morning and, and thanks to Andy Boland for, for his work in, in terms of producing this, the series. So with that, I'll leave you and hope to see you again next week. You've been listening to the podcast version of the Chagisk Signpost series, the weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. Don't forget to join us live every Friday morning for our latest webinar. For more, visit chagisk.ie. And you can also rate, review, and subscribe to the Signpost series on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts from. I'm Mark Gibson, and thanks for listening.